We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tuggeranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. If you want to find out a little bit more about your own location and uh, what Indigenous people uh, hold that as their home, uh, please head over to nativeland.ca uh, to find out more about your region. And without any more talking from me, we're going to get to Jennifer Fennell. Um, again, we're talking about the early insecticide controversies and beekeeper advocacy of the Great Lakes region. I will turn it over to you, Jennifer, now, and uh, you can share your screen. Okay. I'm just going to, here we go. All right. Is that visible to everybody? Yes, it is. Great. Well, thank you very much, Carolyn, for the invitation. And it's a real pleasure to share this work with, uh, with scientists and researchers who work with bees, um, both native and introduced. I'd like to begin by talking about how I came to this project. I'm an environmental historian of 19th and 20th century Canada. And my work explores people's changing relationships with environments over time. My first book, which came out with the University of Toronto Press in 2014, looked at the environmental history of Toronto's John River Valley and the ways this green space at the edge of the 19th century city was used and understood by different groups of people um, as a dumping ground, as a kind of dangerous underworld, as a refuge for the homeless, as a space for industrial imaginings, and for conservationists as a real vital urban green space in the heart of the city. And over the course of my research, I continued to come across references to beekeepers. Uh, these were from you know, very early 19th century honey hunters who scoured the valley for bee trees to successful commercial operators who sowed the valley with honey plants like sweet wild clover to squatters like J. Rice Murphy, or Murph as he was known to his friends, who kept 50 colonies of bees along the rail right of way north of the Bloor Street Viaduct in the 1930s and 40s. To valley cottagers like Charles Soriel, who was a famous Toronto conservationist who kept a large apiary at his summer cottage in the valley, just about a kilometer from his uh, home near Broadview and uh, Danforth. I, in the 1940s and 50s. And Soriel wrote about his experiences as an apiarist in the valley. And it was really through his passions and his interest in other valley beekeepers that my own interests in, in beekeeping and that relationship with, uh, with place and with environment really, really began. I was intrigued by the historical and ongoing significance of the valley for urban beekeepers and the relationship between these changing environments and the people and insects that depend upon them. And this became the basis for a larger research project on the history of beekeeping and environmental change in Ontario and, and neighboring Great Lakes states, really focused on the period between 1880 and 1940. And this is now the subject of a, a book manuscript that I'm in the process of developing. So in it, I explore the efforts of beekeepers to tackle a range of threats to their operations from infectious disease to insecticide poisoning. I look at the ways they adapt to changing forage conditions with agricultural industrialization um, in the early, uh, early to mid 20th century. And I look at the ways they tailored urbanizing environments to serve their interests. So today, I'll talk about one component of that research, beekeeper responses to the threat of insecticide poisoning in the late 19th century. 
And I'll show how beekeepers became early advocates uh, for environmental protection in response to a potent threat to their livelihoods. I identify them in this work as you know, an important and largely overlooked collective voice in the history of insecticide controversies. And as historians, when we think about insecticide controversies, we usually think about the post-war period. And this study of mine um, really shows how beekeepers were active in these debates more than half a century before the more familiar insecticide controversies of you know, the 1940s and 50s. So as we'll see, the rhetoric surrounding incidents of honeybee poisoning in the 1880s and 1890s exposed something that I'm sure is familiar still to you all, the interdependent and often troubled relationship between fruit growers in particular and beekeepers. And part of this tension in the 19th century rested in the fact that growers did not always understand the role of honeybees in fruit po pollination. So they were often quite cavalier in their spraying operations. Advocacy work by growers, um, or by beekeepers rather in this context became as much about urging caution in spraying operations as it was about educating growers on the value of honeybees to their operations. And through that, in the role of honeybees and pollination in this, in this period in the late 19th century, something that just wasn't um, widely known. So my sources for this study, just briefly, the records of the Ontario Beekeeping Association, which is one of Ontario's oldest agricultural associations established in 1881. These were enormously valuable. They're held at the University of Guelph and I just loved working with these records. They have everything from the verbatim uh, documentation of president's addresses at the annual meetings to the documentation of things like the question and answer drawer where you'd have novice beekeepers asking, asking questions and receiving answers from, from more experienced practitioners. I also worked with um, periodicals like the American Bee Journal and the Gleanings in Bee Culture, another bee journal of the period. These were read on both sides of the border and the ABJ, the American Bee Journal was produced weekly. So I just had a wealth of information to work with. And what I found, and, and one of the reasons I expanded this study to include neighboring Great Lakes states was that there was a really lively uh, regional and transnational network of knowledge between um, both beekeepers themselves and honeybee scientists and, and entomologists. This, there was sort of a triangular node of, of communication between university and um, um, state experimental farms in places like Ontario, Michigan, and Ohio. Um, and Ontario played a really important role in this network. They had recently specialized in apiculture with the Ontario Agricultural College uh, in the 1880s. And executive members of the Ontario Beekeeping Association published regular columns and convention reports in these transnational periodicals. They hosted continental events like the North American Beekeepers Convention, which was held in Toronto in 1895 and exhibited their work in places like the Chicago World's Fair uh, in 1893. So why the Great Lakes region? Why am I looking at the history of, of beekeeping in this place in particular? Well, by the 1880s, we can consider the Southern Great Lakes region in particular as really the heartland of early North American commercial beekeeping. So while we might associate the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River corridor with urban development today, in the 19th century associations with the region were predominantly agricultural. And extended growing seasons in lakeshore areas in particular supported the development of specialized fruit belts, the favorable climate of the region, its expanding transportation networks, and established agricultural landscapes provided excellent conditions for honey production and distribution. And so 
if beekeepers in the South and in the West, in places like Texas and California, Alberta and Saskatchewan, if they came to dominate the industry after the 1920s, it was those in Ontario and New York, Ohio and Illinois, Michigan and Wisconsin that kept the majority of honeybees and produced the bulk of US and Canadian honey until that time, until about the 1920s. Okay, so that's the context. Um, I'll move right into my early incidents of poisoning. Okay, so beekeepers began publicizing reports of honeybee die-off as a result of insecticide poisoning beginning in the late 1880s. An Illinois beekeeper named John Smith was one of the first. He reported an incident in May 1889 in the American Bee Journal saying that the apple bloom that year had proved a death warrant to millions of bees in his immediate neighborhood when the owner of a neighboring orchard sprayed his trees with a solution of Paris green or copper aceto arsenate when the trees were in full bloom. Smith conducted a tour of neighboring apiaries and found that, quote, all the bees within the radius of three miles of that orchard were affected, although the ones nearest suffered the worst. He lost 60 of his own honeybee colonies and by his estimate, as many as a, of a dozen of his fellow beekeepers were totally ruined in terms of getting a spring crop of honey out. Incidents of honeybee poisoning began to accumulate across the region in 1891 and 1892. And the losses proved especially pronounced in Michigan and Illinois, where spraying was more widespread. And here you can see in this image, this is a horse-drawn, horse-powered spray pump active. Uh, this is in Pennsylvania in 1890. Other jurisdictions were not immune. North of the border at the Ontario Beekeepers um, 1891 annual meeting, several members reported incidents of losses, especially among apiarists who were adjacent to commercial orchards. And the compound used most frequently in Canada and the US at this time was, was something called Paris Green a highly toxic arsenical compound widely used to color paint. Growers used the poison to reduce damage caused to fruit by insects like codling moths, canker worms, and caterpillars. And by 1889, when the American Bee Journal first recorded the problem of insecticide poisoning, North American orchardists had been experimenting with arsenical poisonings like this for about 20 years. Insecticide use in Ontario, though, was, was really not widespread by the late 1880s. And in fact, the Dominion entomologist, James Fletcher, you know, was presenting to a group of, of beekeepers and said, you know, if, if we could only get our farmers to spray more, we would have better fruit crops. So you see a real effort by um, state entomologists to be uh, pushing this kind of new practice. And this steady increase of insecticide use by orchardists really fits a broader pattern of agricultural intensification in North America in the late 19th century. Um, land disturbance, monoculture cropping, and an ever expanding transportation system created highly favorable conditions for insect outbreaks. And this expansion and intensification of agricultural holdings contributes to simplifying local ecologies and raising the frequency and severity of damage from a growing number of insect pests, something that historian James Wharton called the insect emergency of the 1870s and 1880s. You see in this context, the, the introduction and refinement of insecticide sprays beginning in the 1870s as one of several hallmarks of agricultural modernization. And by the early 1900s, insecticides had really become an essential component of industrial agriculture. Applied liberally, they created what historian Stephen Stahl has described as a chemical shield to protect specialized agriculture against nature's response to a simplified environment. Um, 
in a number of U.S. states, those few holdout farmers who couldn't be persuaded to spray their produce could by the end of the 19th century be coerced to do so through mandatory spraying legislation enacted in a number of states. For growers, the positive effects of spraying their crop yields were indisputable. Prior to spraying, for example, one Trenton, Ontario farmer noted in 1891, we could scarcely keep a perfect specimen of an apple. With the use of Paris green, we would not find in 50 barrels of apples, one barrel of bad ones. So this made obviously a massive difference for farmers. And you started to see the dissemination of these successes in horticultural journals like the American Agriculturalist where they're encouraging farmers to spray berries and vines and fruit trees. Rising insecticide use not only reflected growing market pressures to secure perfect fruit, but they were also the, you know, responding to a widely held sense among farmers that insects were on the increase. And for orchards, orchard farmers in particular, high event investments in tender fruit crops produced correspondingly high incentives to spray. Fruit growers, however, were not the only advocates of insecticide spraying. Influential scientists too advocated unbridled spraying in the early years of insecticide use and really downplayed the threat to honeybees. So for example, uh, in an address to the North American Beekeepers Association in 1891, New York State entomologist Joseph Lintner noted the necessity of spraying and pointed to the absence of, quote, conclusive proof that spraying kills bees. Other entomologists urge greater use of arsenical spraying to reduce damage and waste in fruit production and to generate larger quantities of high quality fruit for market. Soon every orchardist, one entomologist predicted, will spray as surely as he cultivates and harvests. For beekeepers, they saw the effects of these endorsements in the widespread adoption of spraying by farmers and gardeners alike. One ABJ correspondent wrote, spraying has become almost a fad with many spraying to excess gardens, orchards, and shrubs. So beekeepers moved to um, aiming to establish proof. As honeybee losses to poison sprays increase in the early 1890s, beekeepers and scientists alike are growing increasingly alarmed. And among them was an influential uh, entomologist named Albert J. Cook from the Michigan Agricultural College. He, I'm sure, was feeling pangs of, of guilt associated with this and that he was known as the, you know, the highest authority on spraying in the United States at the time. He had developed the spraying system for fruit trees and he may have felt some personal culpability for beekeeper losses. Uh, Cook was an economic entomologist and, and also an authority on beekeeping. So he understood well the valuable role of honeybees in agricultural production. And his concern for the vulnerability of honeybees and their keepers led him to write a series of influential essays in 1892. He stressed the unlikelihood of otherwise strong colonies of honeybees dying in large numbers at the time of the spring bloom, noting that, quote, every well-informed, experienced beekeeper knows that such mortality at such time was previously unknown. In every case, he continued, large orchards in the immediate vicinity had been sprayed with arsenates while the trees were in bloom. And I'm sorry, I've got sun from a window shining on one side of me. So for Cook, the problem lay in the timing of the spray. Honeybees visited fruit tree orchards to forage for nectar and pollen only when the trees were in bloom. Their exposure to risk was limited to a brief two week window when the blossoms still clung to the branches before the fruit began to form. So he proposed a simple solution, stop spraying while the trees are in bloom. And, uh, you know, doubts persist among growers who were reluctant to be told what to do, more or less. 
um, and among scientists who were really enamored with the results of insecticide use. Beekeepers too had a lot of questions. They wanted to understand, was it only adult worker bees who were poisoned? How long did it take bees to die? Could the poison be transmitted to the brood? Could it contaminate honey supplies? And so this need for certainty on all sides um, and this persistence of doubt prompted experimentation on honeybee sensitivity to insecticides at a time when toxicity studies were still relatively rare. Cook was the first in 1892. He released a study confirming that Paris Green was indeed highly toxic to honeybees. He found that they died approximately 24 hours after poisoning, long enough to, quote, carry the poisonous liquid to the hives and store it there, thereby poisoning the brood as well. However conclusive this was for Cook, his experiments failed to gain acceptance from the influential American Association of Economic Entomologists. Conclusive proof was not established until two years later in 1894 through a series of studies conducted by Francis Webster of the Ohio Agricultural Experiment Station. And while Cook's studies had demonstrated honeybee mortality by netting bees within tree canopies sprayed with Paris green, Webster examined the bodies of dead bees submitted for analysis and found, quote, unmistakable traces of the poison in their abdomens. His study put an end to doubts about honeybee sensitivity to Paris green and established that vulnerability to poisoning increased in fair weather favorable for bee foraging. So Webster's results really are a huge game changer here. They are circulated and discussed by beekeeping associations on both sides of the border and used to support campaigns for protective legislation. One of the questions that um, beekeepers and uh, consumers alike had at the time was, you know, did toxicity extend to humans? And most of these concerns uh, surrounded uh, issues around the res arsenical residue on apples. And there was a massive controversy that exploded in Britain at this time about imports of American apples that were um, uh, seen to have still the residues of these pesticides on them. The general response by growers and by um, the US Department of Agriculture in the early 1890s was generally this, you'd have to eat a whole lot of apples to get sick. So they, there were all these various statements about, well, you'd need to eat 20 bushels of apples at a single sitting to obtain enough arsenic for a fatal dose. And summer rains would remove the residue. So really there was no concern. Of course, had these entomologists and agricultural chemists consulted the medical literature in the same period on arsenical toxicity, they may have better appreciated the risks of cumulative injury from spray residue. Instead, they assumed that since spray residues never approach lethal doses, that they must be harmless. Agricultural chemists drew similar conclusions about arsenic residues, um, residues in honey, but for different reasons. Studies by Cook in 1888 found no trace of Paris green in honey from exposed colonies. He noted, you know, there's likely not enough poison in blossom nectar to do us any perceptible harm. Yet I think all of us would prefer our honey with the Paris green left out. Quantity mattered, but so did timing. Fruit trees in the Great Lakes region were typically sprayed in May when bees were feeding most of the honey they produced to their brood rather than storing it for future use or consumption by people. So this explained why honeybee brood routinely died when adult bees were exposed to arsenics, but honey drawn later in the season for human use showed no trace of poison. And what you see is that by 1900, these studies had really quieted public concerns about arsenic sprays by offering assurances about the safety of foods affected by them, leaving beekeepers really among the few dissenting voices by 1900 in terms of um, the spraying of fruit. <clears throat> 
So where do beekeepers go with, with this information, with these toxicity studies uh, about the effects of these poisons on honeybees? Well, they take up uh, quite a large transnational campaign to educate growers. They're armed with this conclusive evidence of honeybee sensitivity and a compelling message about the timing of insecticide applications. They set out to educate neighboring growers and advocate for measures to protect their interests. I'm just gonna try and shift over so I'm not so in the sun. And they're very cautious um, at this time to avoid an anti-spray stance. So many of these beekeepers are farmers themselves. They don't come out saying we really, you know, these insecticides are a real concern. Instead, they say we need judicious and time sensitive spraying. And the considerably greater commercial and political power held by orchardists and, and growers makes this an uphill battle. And I'm sure this, this resonates uh, even today. Their approach is to persuade fruit growers that they had a vested interest in the welfare of bees. And they make appeals to growers about the value of honeybees to their fruit crops and the interest they shared with beekeepers. They work with ag agricultural extension offices and ag apiculture suppliers to produce bulletins and pamphlets to educate growers on the issue. Among them, Cornell University's free and widely used spray calendar and variations on this are used on both sides of the border. But beekeepers in Ontario adopt a really different approach. They elect to pursue legislative remedies to protect their interests. And a delegation from the Ontario Beekeeping Association to the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture results in the passage of something called an act for the further protection of bees as early as 1892. So this is the first legislation of its kind in North America. And the act stipulated that fruit trees could be sprayed only after the bloom had fallen, thereby protecting bees from harm. These measures, there'd been a lot of consultation with growers and growers generally accepted these terms. They noted that they only ever sprayed before or after the bloom in the first place, uh, mid bloom spraying being less effective in targeting insect pests and potentially damaging for fragile blossoms. There were objections from only a small minority who talked about economies of scale in spraying different species of fruit crops and um, you know, chafed at being, uh, you know, having their, their activities circumscribed. So this is really a, a small mi minority of beekeepers in Ontario, at least, of growers rather. And the following year, uh, the North American Beekeepers Association forms a committee based on the Ontario legislation to push for similar legislation among its member states. And they lead uh, several American states to pass, pass spraying legislation in the late 1890s, including Michigan and Vermont, Colorado, New York, and Washington State. Other places with really powerful growing lobbies, uh, notably California, Ohio and Illinois had these bills rejected in response to counter lobbying by fruit growing interests. And generally, um, I'm going to come back to that point. Opposition to spraying legislation was much more pronounced south of the border, where beekeeping advocacy met with resistance and occasional derision from fruit growers and spraying suppliers. A sarcastic editorial in the American Garden in 1890 is an example of this. The editors wrote, surely fruit is of more importance than honey. If those busy workers must have legislation, let us advocate a training school for bees in which they may be taught to keep out of the orchards at the dangerous period. Will not the law compelling an owner of domestic animals to fence them in apply to apiarists as well as to other stock farmers? Is it more lawful for a bee to trespass than for a cow or a pig? And this is a sarcastic editorial, but there were actual trespass laws enacted for bees, wherein bees had to pay in certain states, uh, and New York State was one of them, beekeepers had to pay to pasture their bees on other farmers' fields. So 
it's just fascinating. <laughs> the, it, this editorial for me highlights a really central challenge that lay at the heart of the spraying debates. And that was the real fundamental uncontainability of bees as semi-domesticated foraging insects. As one New York State beekeeper lamented in 1895, if people are allowed to spray so, I may as well give up bees entirely for the bees cannot be shut up, meaning enclosed. For these often small scale producers, tending a form of livestock that could not be fenced in necessarily depended on good relationships with neighboring growers. And given the disparate power relations, the success of their efforts to limit spraying hinged on convincing orchardists of the importance of bees. Even when spraying legislation was passed, it proved difficult to enforce. And the Ontario Beekeeping Association reported years later in 1915 um, that the law against spraying trees in bloom was routinely broken and the associated fine proved insufficient to actually just discourage the orchardists from early spraying since the loss to his crop from not spraying would be more. So we're at a bit of an impasse and uh, beekeepers chose together with the help of allied scientists to begin the work of addressing the misconceptions that lay at the heart of some of these conflicts. And while they saw some degree of success in efforts to educate neighboring growers, Misconceptions about the process of pollination and the intersecting interests of beekeepers and growers proved pervasive and, and really limited the effectiveness of their appeals. As historian James Wharton has shown, prior to the late 19th century, so really not until the end of the 19th century, were bees more, bees tended to be more often viewed as an enemy than an aid to agriculture. And a small but vocal group of growers across the region really held to these older assumptions in the face of increasingly conclusive evidence of the importance of bees in fruit pollination. Grower animosity towards neighboring beekeepers was especially pointed in cases of injury to ripening fruit. So here's an example. Uh, Theodore Woodruff, who was a fruit grower from Niagara Falls, testified at an at a Ontario provincial hearing for spraying legislation that the bees, quote, rob my orchard every year. I know it by experience. They sting the fruit and eat them. I have known them to eat a peach nearly up. Woodworth's complaints were like many born by beekeepers in this period, a case of mistaken identity. It was the malicious wasp, not the industrious bee that was to blame for damage to ripening fruit. And as later studies show, birds played a big role in this too. At a time when the behavior and physiology of wasps and bees was still poorly understood, at least by um, ordinary people, uh, it was possible to draw reasonable but different conclusions from readings of their behavior. South of the border, tensions between beekeepers and fruit growers ballooned into lawsuits in a few cases. One of these cases in 1889 resulted in a much celebrated exoneration of bees as agents of fruit destruction. And this case known as Utter versus Utter um, involved a dispute between two neighboring brothers in Amity County, New York. One was a fruit grower, one was a beekeeper. And the plaintiff alleged that his brother's bees had punctured his peaches and drained their juices destroying their fruit and causing the branches of his trees to wither and die due to the acidity of the dripping juice. This case attracted an enormous amount of attention. Uh, two of the leading lawyers of New York State debated the merits of the case, and they called upon some 30 witnesses over three days of testimony. U.S. Department of Agriculture entomologist Frank Benton was especially convincing. Bees, he argued, argued are in no case the first cause of fruit being injured, as it is not possible for a bee to puncture the skin of even so tender a thing as a ripe peach. He blamed the withering of fruit and trees instead on a bacterial disease of peach trees known as the yellows. 
The jury ruled in favor of the defendant, giving beekeeping interests authoritative backing to their claims that honeybees were necessary assistants rather than pests of the orchard. So within this context of widespread uncertainty and occasional animosity towards honeybees and their keepers, beekeeping associations throughout the Great Lakes region sought scientific evidence to demonstrate the value of honeybees to the orchard and their role in enhancing crops and profits for fruit growers. And you see a series of pollination studies resulted, resulting, um, and they proved especially effective in convincing growers. They showed that trees in bud exposed to honeybee po pollination produced exponentially more fruit than unexposed trees. And not only that, but USDA entomologists proved that for pears, the common honeybee is the most regular, important, and abundant visitor, and probably does more good than any other species. So this study by USDA entomologist Merton Waite was among the first to explore the role of native pollinators and to compare their effects with those of domesticated honeybees. He concluded that while native insects such as moths and wild bees played an, a role in pollinating fruit trees, the size and number of orchards in the fruit belt zones of the Great Lakes region and places like Southern California demanded additional support from more numerous, in his words, and efficient honeybees. The, the dissemination of such expert opinion in respected horticultural magazines such as Better Fruit and Green's Fruit Grower helped to raise awareness about the role of honeybees in pollination. And together with advocacy efforts by beekeeping associations and activist scientists like Cook, these studies also reduced the frequency and severity of poisoning incidents. Ignorant or malicious activities continued, but as the exception rather than the norm. And beekeepers on both sides of the border noted in particular the damaging work of itinerant spraying machine agents who, who were intent on turning a penny in their eyes, had little incentive to spray judiciously. To be sure, refraining from spraying for the two week window when trees were in bloom did not infringe greatly on grower freedoms. As grower testimony at Ontario's 1892 parliamentary hearings had demonstrated, experienced orchardists understood that mid bloom spraying was not only ineffective in controlling insect pests, but also potentially damaging to their fruit trees. So a win for beekeepers on the question of spray timing, in other words, did not translate to a broader appreciation of the dangers of insecticide use. While changes in spraying practice by the turn of the century allowed beekeepers on both sides of the border to feel more confident about the safety of their bees, the absence of a broader recognition of the ecological consequences of insecticide use meant that their fight was far from over. And I'll turn briefly to sum up um, quite a broad period, a period of time in this last few minutes of my talk. So the lessons of the 1890s, I argue, uh, would be forgotten and relearned on multiple occasions as the 20th century unfolded. Uh, by the 1910s, beekeeper confidence in spraying precautions waned in response to the widespread adoption of lead arsenate by orchard, orchardists. And this was an alternative to Paris Green. It was prized for its greater effectiveness and superior adhesion to foliage. So it was less likely to be washed away by spring rains. And as a result, it renewed beekeeper concerns about honeybee exposure to spray residue. You also had in this period, the replacement of horse and hand powered spray pumps with gasoline powered ones in the same period, which furthered the ease and extent of insecticide use. It wasn't such hard work anymore. Resulting increases in the prevalence and persistence of arsenical insecticides forced beekeepers to renew their pleas for caution once again in, in the 1910s and 20s. Uh, 
They get a brief reprieve in the 1920s with the origin of pollination contracts. And these gave beekeepers reason to believe once again that their interests would be protected. They were, um, as many of you are familiar, I'm sure written agreements between growers and beekeepers that outlined the terms for renting honeybee colonies for pollination services. So they provided a formal mechanism for honeybee protection and compensation for beekeepers in the event of losses. But as orchards in intensified production in the 1920s and 30s, expanding in size, specializing in fewer variety of trees, we see insect pests grow more prevalent and more difficult to control. Orchardists responded with larger and more frequent applications of arsenical insecticides, leading beekeepers really to pull back their colonies from orchard locations and provide pollination services with much greater trepidation. Meanwhile, we're seeing old debates about the timing of the spray and the toxicity of these insecticides to honeybees continue to resurface periodically in really discouraging ways. Uh, beekeepers responded with, with weary indignation, for example, to the claims of a Stanford University entomologist in 1924 that spraying during the bloom was not harmful to bees, blasting his claims with reference to recent and more comprehensive studies to the contrary. Faith in technological solutions, such as the use of bee repellents, sulfur, creosote, carbolic acid, the use of these repellents in spray compounds, uh, these show a return to another lesson of the 1890s. Substances like these had been introduced periodically through the um, late 19th and early 20th century, and they would garner initial enthusiasm among growers and beekeepers alike, only to be rejected by beekeepers for their disappointing performance. Changes in the post-war period were especially disastrous for beekeepers. The release of DDT and other broad spectrum insecticides after World War II proved even more damaging to apiaries than the arsenates they replaced. And the lethal effects of these new chemicals were exacerbated by changes in spraying practice. So for example, the use of airplanes to distribute insecticides created the novel problem of drift onto non-target plants. Aerial spraying also transferred, significantly for beekeepers, transferred the control of insecticide application from the farmer to third-party aerial spray operators. And for beekeepers, this transfer brought about a slippage in hard-earned knowledge about honeybee protection, the result of decades of advocacy and education efforts with orchardists. So while growers had generally adopted the practice of spraying after the bloom had fallen and early in the morning when bees are less active, spraying companies tended to be less discriminate. Losses to suffered in this context contributed to a steady decline of beekeepers across the region after 1945. And I'll just show you these figures for Ontario as an indication of this. These are a percentage of the total in in red here, you can see the number of beekeepers. In green, the number of colonies as a percentage of the total between um, a height in the 1920s, which is where my data from the agricultural census begins, um, and proceeding into close to the present here. So you can see the real decline after uh, 1945. Beekeeper numbers are starting to decline earlier in the 30s, but you can see the bee colonies really start to. Um, where they start to decline. Um, and it's, these figures are quite similar for neighboring US states. Decisions to fold operations were informed by old frustrations. Beekeepers would find as they had in the late 19th century that they had very little recourse in cases of poisoning. The pursuit of legal remedies often, or at least occasionally in the US especially, led to a reversal of charges when through a strange twist in the US law, beekeepers could be accused of trespass in that their livestock had been poisoned while foraging beyond the bounds of the keeper's property. Honeybees' fundamental freedom to forage 
and the problems this presented for their keepers underlay the spraying debates of the 1940s and 50s, just as it had in the 1890s. And like the 1890s, beekeepers faced the additional challenge of limited evidence in efforts to press for damages. So unlike cases for fish and wildlife or larger livestock, where poison carcasses provided both evidence for examination and convincing visual support for lobbying campaigns, and you know, those of you who might be, have read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, this is a big part of her analysis. Honeybee poisonings too often left, quote, dead bees scattered all over the countryside and none in the hive. Beekeepers learned from experience that without concrete evidence, excellent records and witnesses to the damage caused to one's colonies by another's application of pesticides, that they stood very little chance of success in court. Not until the early 1950s, when grower interests were themselves compromised by spray technologies, would beekeepers achieve some limited gains. Surprisingly, shared concerns about the effects of herbicides and not insecticides would do more to unite beekeepers and fruit growers in efforts to urge caution in spray applications than past efforts to bring about regulatory control. So incidents of crop damage caused um, by drift from roadside herbicide applications really awakened grower concerns beginning in the 1940s with the commercial release of 2,4-D in 1945 brings about serious losses to cotton and melons, tomatoes, et cetera, and grower concerns really uh, explode in this context. In response, we see several Canadian provinces and Western states passing legislation in the early 1950s requiring insurance, commercial licenses, and special permits for herbicide application and in both Canada and the United States, federal legislation on these, uh, on these topics in the 1960s and 70s. So herbicides in some come to benefit the apiculture industry by causing all growers to be alert to the probable damage that can be done by drifting chemicals. Greater pre precision in pesticide application, however, was cold comfort for beekeepers in a period of rapid increases in, a num in the number of commercial insecticides available on the market and the widening range of their uses, agricultural, commercial, and residential. Um, just a real, you're seeing more variety and more uses to which these insecticides are put. So a few conclusions to wrap up. Between 1880, and 1900 in that 20 years that I've really focused on here. Beekeepers in the Great Lakes region established themselves as advocates for environmental protection at a time when few others saw reason for concern. In seeking to defend their economic interests, they emerged as really the only agriculture producers in the late 19th century to form a united front urging caution in insecticide application. Beekeepers on both sides of the border work to mitigate risks and reduce their losses, at first in Ontario and then in Michigan and New York State in the late 19th century. They drew upon the support of state and provincial agricultural colleges to advance their concerns and obtain legislative remedies. And their efforts to convince growers had associated benefits in demonstrating the value of honeybees to crop pollination at a time when this was not widely appreciated. By the turn of the century, their efforts had borne some success in reducing incidents of honeybee poisoning, but over the longer term, efforts to protect honeybees from harm brought, brought greater frustration than success. Strategies that had worked in the late 19th century and early 20th century, such as dialogue and education with neighboring growers, were less successful from the 1930s on when orchardists expanded and intensified fruit production and with it, the frequency and quantity of insecticide applications. Earlier directives to refrain from spraying while the trees were in bloom had largely aligned with orchardist interests. Mid-bloom spraying was at best ineffective in controlling fruit tree press, pests rather. But as spray volumes, persistence, and toxicity increased, 
implementing honeybee protections became too costly and inconvenient. Growers' more powerful interests left beekeepers and their bees to shoulder the risks of an increasingly toxic countryside or to fold their operations as many chose to do. So more often than not, beekeepers in the mid 20th century found themselves in the same position as their 19th century predecessors. Existing legislation resulting, regulating the timing of spray applications was not only difficult to enforce, it was increasingly irrelevant in the context of pesticide drift. And the heavy burden of evidence required by the courts continued to stymie beekeeper claims for redress. Much of the education and advocacy work that beekeepers undertook proved as well to be frustratingly fruitless. The view of the American Bee Journal editors held in the, in the mid 1940s, um, so sorry, American Bee Journal editors in the mid 1940s celebrated the fact that the public had just recently become, quote, awake to the importance of bees in pollination. These mirrored statements made by beekeepers 50 years earlier. So you see this really cyclical um, process happening here. In both periods, beekeepers found grounds for encouragement in this evidence of growing awareness among agriculturalists and the wider public. And they used it to advocate for reasoned discussion rather than agitation. So as a honeybee scientist um, Eckert wrote in 1952, quote, the value of honeybees to agriculture is being realized and the apiculture industry can profit more by demonstrating this fact than by militating, militating against the use of pesticides. So let's just talk reasonably, let's not be militant. But just as the 1890s, just as in the 1890s, reason discussion would be disappointingly inadequate. Assurances from orchardists would prove difficult to rely upon in the context of new technologies and new practices and in the absence of a broader recognition of the ecological consequences of insecticides. And the bees as ever would prove difficult to contain. So my last slide here, why did beekeepers find themselves teaching and learning the same lessons? Well, I think in large part, the answer lies in this differential economic and political power among producer groups. Orchardists and agriculturalists held larger commercial interests and greater political capital than commercial beekeepers. Faith in new compounds and new technologies and a preference for the complex over the simple solution, for example, developing bee repellents rather than curbing spray use, also contributed to the slow and cyclical nature of pollinator protection strategies. And finally, a kind of forgetfulness has contributed to recent repeated cycles of honeybee losses and corresponding beekeeper advocacy. In the 19, early 1900s, as in the 1920s, beekeepers felt that they had solved the problem of grower misconceptions and carelessness in insecticide applications. And in each case, the advent of new, more efficient compounds and more effective spray technologies meant they had to advocate for protections all over again. So we continue to forget and relearn the lessons of the 1890s. As recent experience with colony collapse has shown us, beekeepers still bear the brunt of losses from widespread insecticide use. And in places where compensation programs exist, the burden of evidence remains daunting. An important foundation for hope, I suggest, exists in the fulfillment of Albert Cook's 1891 wish for greater harmonization of grower and beekeeper interests. Unlike the 1890s, when misconceptions about honeybees led a small subset of vocal orchardists to distinguish their interests from those of neighboring beekeepers, 21st century growers are deeply aware of their reliance on honeybee pollination. This awareness has reached further into public consciousness than ever before in the context of ongoing honeybee losses and the powerful knowledge dissemination tools of social media. Public concern for pollinators has led to swelling memberships in urban beekeeping associations and rooftop hives at luxury hotels. 
And combined with the significant economic threat of pollinator decline, it has prompted governments on both sides of the border to implement pollinator protection strategies. Like their 19th century predecessors, beekeepers and allied scientists have led the way in advocating for these protections. Their efforts to educate broader publics on the value of honeybees and, and native bees, I would add, and other pollinators to agriculture production has made human reliance on insect pollination and the vulnerability of insect populations one of the most successful ecological education stories of the early 21st century. And I'll be curious to hear your response to that, whether I'm, I'm correct in my assessment. While beekeeper numbers and economic power in the Great Lakes region have declined significantly since the late 19th century, their political fortunes have surely risen. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. That was um, very eye-opening. I, I really enjoyed um, the dichotomy in like the late 1800s between talking about the insect emergency, but then also the mandatory spring legislation. Like, yeah. Very, very fascinating. Um, I will open it up to discussion um, and questions. So everyone is welcome to unmute themselves and put on your video if you like, and uh, we can have a conversation. Um, Dr. Bunnell, I'd like to ask, uh, I'm aware that in Washington state, at least, many historical orchids, orchards, <laughs> are heavily con soil contaminated with arsenic. Yes. Um, what's the case in Ontario? I've read a few studies on this in terms of that, you know, long persistence of arsenicals in the soil. Um, I know that for New York State, I believe there's been similar studies done. I don't know about Ontario, but I would assume we're dealing with something very similar. Uh, I think one of the things that I read in this context was that a lot of those orchard sites are now subdivisions. So you have, um, they're not necessarily still in agricultural production. It depends on the region, but one of the studies I read talked about, all right, we've got arsenical toxicity in places where kids may be playing, which is, a, which is another concern altogether. So yeah, long persistence. And I think that's, a, that's another side note to this study, you know, the, the long arm uh, and persistence of these kinds of debates, but also these, especially in the case of 19th century arsenical insecticides, uh, the long reach of those, of those compounds. Thank you. I have a, well, a question, and, but also a, a comment. So th thank you so much for the very uh, wonderful uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. And, and hearing, hearing what went on in, in the, the late 1800s and like, well, okay, so there's you know, fighting between beekeepers and farmers, lawyers involved, uh, misinformation. I'm like, where, where, where have I heard this before? It, it's just, it seems like we just went through the whole thing with, you know, Conroy. So what, this part about like the, the relearning things, I, I think really, really hit hard. And, and so what was it, what, what, what led to this kind of relapse in memory? What, why are we consistently like, it seems like we're, we're on this vicious uh, repeat cycle where the lessons learned just kind of never kind of persisted. Yeah, I mean, my conclusions around that are really, um, you know, one of them, as I said near the end, that faith in a technological fix to, to solve this problem seems to be, you know, uh, there's that ever, ever stokeable hope that we'll come up with something that will solve the current problem. But I think when we look backwards, uh, rather than expecting the next uh, technological breakthrough around the corner, we can see just how long uh, we've been that beekeepers and, and others have been in this position and we've been replacing the compounds and only extending the reach of these um, these compounds through different technologies uh, in terms of the forgetting yeah i mean i've been wrestling with this too and i just think it's such an uphill battle it's been an uphill battle since 1890 and that that, that power differential certainly plays a role here um, and I also think, you know, uh, we don't know our history here well enough. Um, we, most of the literature on insecticide controversies, as I said in the beginning, uh, 
begins in the post-war period looking at um, synthetic insecticides. And you know, there's, there's very few works on that, that earlier that history, history. Of, of the use of these arsenicals. And I think when you do that larger trace and you can just see those cycles um, and you know, different generations of beekeepers uh, fighting the same battles as those that came before them. I think maybe um, organizational memory and, and institutional memory, but also just what are you gonna do? It's the same uphill battle, like all of the, um, the things I cited about trespass suits in the United States and what, you know, you're, you're bringing a, a case before the courts and you have it turned against you. It, it's, uh, I think um, the legal landscape in the US made this especially challenging. Yes, thank you. That was a fabulous talk. And it's really nice to realize that beekeepers have been troublemakers for 140 years. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm now uh, far more sympathetic to beekeepers than I was before your talk. Um, I'm just, I guess you know about the a kind of similar situation in New Brunswick with the blueberry growers where the forest pesticide sprays yes. okay I, I do you know what the current situation on that is i know it's way away from what you've been talking about but yeah is, i'm is, afraid is, i is, i don't i did a podcast for one of their um ag extension offices that they actually their one of their scientists was the first to reach out to me when this when this piece was published and so i did a talk for them and he really noted um He's someone who does knowledge dissemination um, for, for bee, the beekeepers in the Atlantic provinces. Um, and uh, he, he noted as, as I'm hearing here, just how uncanny some of this was in terms of how cyclical um, and how on the ongoing relevance of some of the um, topics that beekeepers were pointing to in the 1890s. Uh, so, but I'm afraid, uh, Lawrence, I don't know the, the update on that situation there. I tend to look backwards. <laughs> but, um, it, well, does, it, does, it does help me to be aware of the present situation. Sure. Yeah. Thanks very much. That was great. Good. Thank you. Um, Victoria, you have your hand up? Yeah, I'll jump in with a, with a sort of question and comment. Again, it's very interesting. Dr. Bonnell, like, the fact that they were suing, the beekeepers were suing, of that board were suing the beekeepers for letting their bees fly across the land. It's just mind boggling. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, did you find anything in terms of human health concerns banning with beekeepers? I know you mentioned that, like you see the picture with the beekeeper, the people just with the, everything missing around them and scientific literature did know that some of these things caused human health issues. Did you find anything that and people like farmers standing up for their health? Or? There's been a lot done on that by historians of California in particular. Um, historians have looked at intersections between labor and environment uh, and geographers who've done really great work on that. And yeah, that image that I showed you near the beginning of the presentation, I think if you look closely, you'll notice that this is in Pennsylvania and the sprayers I believe are all black in that scene. Um, and so, yeah, just who's doing this work and who's being subjected to these chemicals, let alone the horses uh, who are there as well. So um, certainly these were toxic compounds that had effects on people's health. And while I haven't seen direct studies to the region I'm looking at and the particular period I'm looking at, when you look to these studies in California, historical studies of um, where they've really documented uh, 19th and early 20th century migrant farm workers health concerns around insecticide, insecticide spraying the documentation is really clear yeah uh, second question just gonna jump in with the two um did you see in literature when you know orchard farmers realized that they're native actually are native bees that are positive so first they thought the bees are bad get rid of all the insects all together because insects are bad did you see where there was a transition was it when the honeybee keepers actually had proof, like studies like, hey, honeybees are helping pollinators that the farmers finally, I know some farmers still don't realize that, you know, apples need pollinators, but do you know when the shift kind of happened? That was yeah, that there were wild pollinators? I didn't have time to get into it here, so I'm glad you asked me that question, Victoria, because there's, uh, 
there was a really interesting debate between, um, I talked about that animosity in some cases, especially in the US between um, growers, especially orchardists and neighboring beekeepers, beekeepers in the, in the community. Um, it's crazy that there was animosity between them, but yes, there was. And uh, uh, one of the debates is orchardists would say, hey, we had apple orchards here before honeybees. Like there were apple orchards in this place and this place before they had actually imported bees. So we don't even need you beekeepers. Why don't you all take off? And uh, it took, you know, scientists like, like Albert Cook and Merton Waite to make that argument that the scale and size of these orchards, especially by the 1920s and 30s, really required um, added supports from honeybee pollinators. Uh, what they didn't talk about, I find, was the effects of these insecticides on native pollinators. That doesn't seem to come up, um, at least in the literature I looked at. Are the sources the you know I've combed through at least a lot of records, and I didn't see a, I didn't see reference to that. But beekeepers certainly are very aware of native pollinators. They're very aware, necessarily, as you know, given that their economic um, livelihoods depend on these things. They're aware of bloom. They're, they're very environmentally aware. And I think that's what attracted me to them in the first place. They're such knowledgeable masters of um, bloom and seasonality and weather. And they're looking to native pollinators um, for you know the good ones at least, and the ones who are often recording their talks in the Ontario Beekeeping Association and other places. Um, they're gathering information uh, from watching native pollinators as well as their own bees. So. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Kent. Um, the uh, concept of the trespass suits from the 19th century really brought to mind strongly the medieval suits in which various animals were prosecuted for. Oh, yeah damage. Have you ever tried comparing the legal precedents that the medieval suits made for this weird 19th century phenomenon? Where animals themselves are put on trial and punished according to offenses they have committed. Yeah, um, I haven't, but that's a really interesting point. And I might draw that out in the book in terms of trying to look at the common law precedents for uh, mm -hmm. these trespass suits, because as far as I know, they're not really as big a deal uh, in Ontario on the Canadian side of the border. I only saw reference to them in the US and you'd have Ontario beekeepers looking at these things and going, oh my God, you know, is this, is this something that could, could happen to us? So those periodicals that I examined are really such a forum for beekeeper interest. So some of these trespass suits might be happening in California or in Florida. Uh, but beekeepers across the continent are aware of them. And you've got the North American Beekeepers Union, which comes to the defense of beekeepers. If you then they're constantly advertising in these periodicals saying, pay your dues, we'll help you, you know, defeat these uh, suits of nuisance sometimes, right, which we still see today, but um, trespass was was among those things. And and that law in New York State where beekeepers were having to pay their neighboring uh, uh, farmers for access to pasture land for forage was really quite remarkable as well. Another place you might look is in Quebec because many of the examples from the medieval period come from the Catholic Church. And of course, in France, that was replaced by the Napoleonic Code, but not in Quebec. So there might be some remnant of it. That would be interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I mean, I have sort of arbitrarily chosen Ontario and these Great Lakes states mainly because uh, my French reading isn't as good, but um, that would be really interesting if I'm able to, to flush that out a little bit more. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions that we can have? Uh, before we uh, get going for today. I'll just say that as a, as a conservationist, Jennifer, like the idea of like having a trespassing tax for honeybees that like 
go into protected area sounds amazing to me. I knew you <laughs> like that. <laughs> like we need more of that. Tax the beekeepers. They need more you said, time. Yeah. When you said that they have to pay, pay to, to use a forge. Well, actually, that's, that could be a good idea. Like they're getting all those forges for free. They're selling the product for free. Why should they get access to all these resources for free? You know, it's going to cause problems. So yeah, I had that thought. We said, oh, that could actually be a good idea. <laughs> and I, I, I realize it's in speaking to all of you that, you know, introduce it, talking about honeybees. I talk about honeybees because honeybees and their keepers leave records, right? Well, their keepers leave records. And there's so little historical um, work that I can that I can access in terms of native bees and other pollinators. But there's a treasure trove of material on the honeybees that very few people have worked with. And thinking about beekeepers as these early environmentalists is uh, was really compelling for me. So we yeah, I know that you guys have some problems you. with them, but yeah, we need to connect you with Lisa Myers, who does all of who did all that archive work with um, Mike McDonald and you know all that indigenous medicine and native pollinator work. Yeah, so for sure, yeah, and who knows what else is out there. The Sorry. archives are so full of surprises. Yeah. <laughs> Such a delight. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. To speak to you. Yeah. Thank you. And to hear your responses. I was a little nervous. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I really appreciate everyone attending today. As you know, the recording is going to be posted online on our YouTube channel, um, as well as uh, on our website. Uh, I think going forward into our weekend, we can all consider you know, why we keep thinking that the next toxic technology is going to be better than the last. Something to consider. Thank you. We look forward to hearing more about your work, Jennifer. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Have a great weekend.